um, I have bad news. I am not going to talk about anything, John. So I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just asking Rich where they got that description. Uh, but it'll still be really good. Uh, it's just not going to be that. Uh, so, thank you uh, for having uh, for having me here. You know, one thing in my bio is I used to work at the Chamber of Commerce over in Seattle. Uh, so I have a unique appreciation for the work that Betty and the team do, but also all of you do as Chamber volunteers. And I should mention uh, also Rich White is a leader in our team here in Washington State. He was a longtime uh, Bellevue Chamber uh, leader. And while we talk about anniversaries, believe it or not, we just celebrated Rich's 10th anniversary. Uh, at 15, sorry, 15th anniversary uh, at Boeing. So uh, for all of you that remember, like I do, back when Rich was working here, uh, time flies when you're having fun. Uh, I live here in Bellevue. I grew up in Renton. I, uh, I still think of the U bookstore as sort of the new U bookstore here in Bellevue, so it's kind of weird that it's been 30 years, but uh, uh, it's all good. What I thought um, I would talk about here today is a little bit about, uh, not the space industry, uh, but a little bit about Boeing and where we are here in Washington, sort of our history together, current status of Boeing uh, in the state, and then we will talk a little bit about the future. Uh, of aerospace but more from a market perspective and less from a, a technological perspective, although I'll be happy to try to answer any questions you might have about that uh, when we have some time. But first, I thought I would show you guys a little video to get a glimpse of what uh, Boeing is like here in Washington. You're going to see a whole bunch of stuff, so uh, first and foremost, everything you see in the video was, was filmed here in the state, uh, either in Bellevue or Renton or Everett or, or Auburn or Fredericton or wherever we uh, operate in the state. It talks a little bit about, or I should say, it shows you a little bit about uh, the people at Boeing, what they do. Uh, it also shows a little bit uh, of our community presence in some of the areas of the company. Uh, sponsors and some of the organizations we partner with out in the community. Uh, and then I'll come back afterwards. It's only a couple minutes long, and I'll talk a little bit uh, uh, about the company. Welcome there. So, if it all works, let's start. Otherwise, 
but a hundred years ago in July, uh, Boeing was founded uh, on, on Lake Union, quickly moved to this building that you see here, uh, down on the, what's in the west, uh, the west uh, bank of the Duwamish River. Uh, and our first product as a company, this is uh, in the original uh, South Lake Union building, is a thing called the uh, Model C, which was a float plane um, purchased by the Navy. Shortly after, oh sorry, I should say the company made its first charitable contribution to the uh, University of Washington in 1917 as a wind tunnel, uh, which is still up there. Uh, those of you that went to the UW uh, may have seen the wind tunnel that's uh, still on campus. And then not uh, too long after that, World War I came and went. There was a uh, surplus of um, formerly defense airplanes that were commercial airplanes uh, they glided the market and the company had to, the first time we had to save the company uh, here in Seattle you can see one of the products the company went into uh, boats and furniture so I don't know if you've ever around in speaking but you might see Boeing uh, furniture and this is the sea sled which was a boat uh, that Boeing built for a little while to stay around of course World War II B-17 and B-29s uh, those were built here in this factory which you probably can't see but this is it anybody you might remember from your Washington State history class, the camouflage building. Um, that building at its peak, these 17s every day uh, during World War II. Uh, you'll see later on, we're, we're going to brag about the fact that we're about to start producing 47 and 737s every month uh, in Renton. I mean, it's a really incredible uh, notion to think of 17 a day. Clearly, we're designing and building for a longer useful life now than we were in World War II, but it's still a pretty impressive number. This is largely who was in the factory. Uh, Rosa the Riveter, right, came from uh, this notion of, of women putting together airplanes. Uh, interesting fact, you were more likely to die building the airplanes in World War II than you were flying them. Uh, the factories were very dangerous places, and of course, at 17 a day, you don't have a lot of time uh, to stop and think about safety. but. Uh, Every, it was, there was a lot of dangerous work being done in World War II, not just both flying uh, in the airplanes. Shortly thereafter, this is now a picture of the Renton facility. This building uh, still stands today, but uh, what you see in front of it is the 707 one I talked about, uh, Boeing up in the jet age uh, and commercial aviation, and that was done right there on the uh, South Shore Lake, Washington, which would have been you know, right here, um, out of the Renton plant. This is in the late 60s. The first plane we built out of the upper plant was the 747. And then, um, you know, the next picture I'm going to show you was a lot of people's pick, favorite picture of the 747. And for like about 12 weeks this year, a lot of people didn't like this picture of the 747. I will tell you, I was always a fan of And now it's a really popular uh, picture again uh, as we are getting closer and closer to the playoffs. This is a picture of the 747 today. You know, we, uh, as a company, are the largest exporter uh, in America by, by, by value. We always say by value. Like, what else would it be by, right? Uh, it's by value. We're the largest exporter uh, in America. You can see here that in 2014, we produced 53% of all the exports uh, coming out of Washington State. The Renton plant alone was somewhere between 15 and 17% of all exports. Uh, coming out of Washington State. I suspect we'll go up this year as we've gone up uh, in rates over the course of the last few years and we'll continue to do so. So, you know, uh, we've been in the news a lot lately. We've been in the news a lot lately about Boeing's employment uh, in Washington uh, or its employment in other places. Uh, and so I thought I would talk a little bit about that to give you a perspective on uh, what Boeing in Washington really means. I love this chart. First and foremost, you should know that half of all Boeing employees in the world work in the state of Washington. We've got about 160,000 people worldwide. We have 80,000 people uh, in the state of Washington. This chart shows dark blue being Washington employment, light blue being outside Washington employment. Uh, if you add up all of the dark blue to the right of us, except for any technically any one company, if you add up all the employment from all those other great Washington companies, it's approximately equal to the Boeing employment. Uh, in the state of Washington. And then the thing that I really love is we have a lot more dark blue on our line than all these other companies do. Uh, and so Microsoft, which is a great community leader, a great partner of ours, they've got about a quarter of their population in Washington, which is terrific. Uh, Amazon has about 20% of their population in Washington, and all these other folks are down uh, at 5 and 10% of their employment in Washington. These are all great Washington companies, but um, you know, we continue to see ourselves 
as a Washington company, mostly because half of their loan, uh, half of their loan was worth of work does so, you know, probably within about 30 miles of where we are uh, right, right, right now, day, every day. Uh, excellent jobs, $90,000 average going wage. If you're a machinist, it's probably about $75,000. If you're an engineer and you're in SPIA, it's over $110,000 a year. Uh, uh, average wage to be a building engineer across the SPIA bargaining unit. And then you can see uh, how our employment has really grown uh, over the years here in Washington, of course, coming out of 9-11. Uh, in the tragic events of, of September 11, 2001, we took a huge dip as the forest litigation industry tanked. Uh, and then starting in 2003, really when the state uh, decided to implement the incentive package that landed the 787 in Washington, uh, you've seen us grow. The state's own analysis, and the next chart is a little busy, so forgive me, uh, but the state's own analysis shows that in 2003, when the initiative, or sorry, when the incentives were first passed, about a third of Boeing's workforce uh, was in the state of Washington. About 150,000 people by about 50,000 people uh, in the state of Washington. That has grown to where we are today at 160,000 people worldwide, or 10,000 more uh, than were worldwide uh, 12 years ago, but about 80,000 in the state of Washington, which is now a half. So since then, we've gone from a third of our workforce to a half. The company as a whole has grown by only 10,000 people worldwide. That's the Washington population has grown by 30. Uh, and when you think about that, what that means is the rest of uh, the population around the world is actually Trump uh, um, by about 20,000 heads uh, throughout Boeing. So um, even throughout this period of time when we've lamented things like other facilities opening in other states and all that kind of stuff, Boeing has concentrated in the state uh, to a degree really unforeseen uh, in a long, long, long time. Uh, and about half of that growth has been in our two big uh, bargaining units, the SPIA unit uh, and the IAM unit. You know, in 2003, the IAM uh, unit had about 18,000 members, uh, and today it's had about 34, 35,000 members. So we've seen tremendous growth uh, in the union jobs uh, here in Washington. I would challenge anybody to find someone who's added, you know, uh, 16,000 union jobs over. Uh, over a 12 year period of time. It's just because you know, today, uh, in the environment, uh, U.S. manufacturing is in, it just doesn't. Forgive me, I think I'm at the end of the range for the clipper, so I always have to put my hand way out there. Uh, and then a little bit more about the incentives. You know, I think a lot of times we think of them as, you know, the Boeing tax deal, right? I'm sure everybody said that. I know that every once in a while even I say it, and uh, we should have a jar at the office for every time we say that or something, but uh, the, the, the so-called Boeing taxes are actually aerospace incentives uh, passed by the state of Washington. The number on the screen here that grew from 298 to four, in 07 to 471 in 2014 are the number of companies around the state uh, that are um, using the aerospace tax incentives uh, to grow their business. So it's a huge uh, part of a competitive and growing industry uh, that creates jobs both inside aerospace and of course outside of aerospace throughout the state. So, what do we do uh, together? Well, first and foremost, we make the 737 the most successful commercial aviation, uh, air, most successful commercial airplane in the history of the world. Uh, we make it in Renton. We are currently at 42 a month or two every working day. Uh, we are about to head to 47 a month and then we are about to head to 52 a month uh, in 2018 and that will be um, you know, sort of two and a half uh, every working day on three production lines uh, down in Renton. We make a whole host of airplanes up at the Everett facility, all of the uh, what we call wide body airplanes. So think of airplanes with two aisles, right? The 787, the 747, the 767, uh, and the 777, cranking those out at, uh, when you think of the 87 and the 777, at between 100 and 120 airplanes a year uh, for these wide body planes. And then of course the 47 and the 67 are much lower rate, one to two uh, every month. Um, but the 87 and the 777, eight, eight and 10 um, uh, of each of those models comes out of the factory uh, every month. And then we like to say we also make community here. So between Boeing and its employees and its retirees, uh, on an average uh, annual basis, uh, we donate about $50 million out into the community. Uh, it was slightly more than that in 2014. We will come in uh, right around that uh, in 2015 to a host of organizations. We tend to focus in five areas, arts and culture, uh, civic organizations, health and human services, education, 
uh, and the environment with a, with a pretty heavy emphasis uh, on STEM education and working to make sure our youth have the skills that we know they're going to need to take jobs not only at Boeing but at certainly any, at any number of companies uh, here on the east side uh, in, the, in, the technology, in the technology sector. Innovation for the future. First and foremost, 737 MAX. You saw the rollout of this airplane. It was sort of during the latest show there uh, in the video. This airplane rolled out of the Renton factory, the first one here two weeks ago, or, or about 10 days ago. We have uh, on the books right now a little less than 3,000 orders. Um, uh, we just booked another 80, you might have seen in the news today. So we actually could be over 3,000. Uh, orders right now, you know, that's uh, that's a few years of work, even at 40 to 50 a month. Um, uh, one of the most successful launches ever for a uh, commercial airplane. The, there's some uh, distinctive things about the MAX. You see the, the funky wing tips on the end, right? So it used to be the wings went out and then all of a sudden they started going up and now they're going up and down. Uh, when when uh, at the end, uh, probably most people know that's about fuel burn, so you get about a 2% savings uh, with the wing that goes up you get another point or two uh, for the wing that goes down and when fuel is 40 percent of the cost of um, uh, the airlines every little bit uh, makes a difference you would be amazed at how much fuel uh, airlines go through here so every percent uh, is really important this uh, plane will be about 15 or 16 percent more fuel efficient than the current generation of the 737 um, that what we call the 737 next generation it will be about 13%, I think, more efficient than its competitor, the uh, A320, uh, which is built by Airbus. Uh, that's something that not only do we all as consumers care about, but again, we go back to the cost of operating and we know the airlines care a great deal about environmentalism, but also <laughs> their cost of doing business. Uh, this is a picture here of a, a grand opening we just had down on Boeing Field. We opened what we call our Seattle Delivery Center. Uh, we have been working for the last two years to basically build a three-gate airport on the west side of Boeing Field that will be used to deliver uh, the two to three uh, airplanes every day uh, to our customers. Uh, uh, it, we, we did a similar one in Everett uh, just a couple of years ago. Uh, this is all in the spirit of getting ready for this uh, uh, continued increase in rate uh, and production that we know is coming here over the next few years. The 777X, the other big airplane that we just uh, announced um, uh, that we are going to start building. This one will be built in Everett. It will take the place uh, of the current generation of the 777. This is the one that we got to talk a whole lot about back in the fall of 2013 when the state went into special session, uh, extended some incentives to Boeing if Boeing would locate the next generation of the airplane here. Uh, and then of course we had um, a long discussion uh, over the uh, Thanksgiving and uh, and uh, Christmas holidays and into the New Year holiday with the union, but finally when the union uh, did vote to uh, accept the contract that its leadership uh, and Boeing leadership had negotiated, we were thrilled to be able to say the 777X. And equally important, it's uh, all new uh, third or fourth generation com uh, composite wing will be built uh, up in Everett. This is a picture taken <coughs> maybe about six weeks ago now of this new factory uh, that we are building in Everett. It's a 1.3 million square foot factory. To give you a sense of how big that is, you could put 24 NFL football fields inside this factory. Uh, it's kind of hard to see, but that's a person right there. Um, and these are, you know, these are trains. Uh, we've been giving tours to uh, elected officials and others, and actually, you, there's, uh, you'll go in and there's a platform right about here, and we've got cranes on the platform inside the building. It's just, it's an immense building, and it's really hard to understand sort of what a, what a you know, 1.3 million 12-story building looks like. Uh, but that is, it's all built to uh, build these new wings, which will be the biggest wings uh, ever built. They'll be so big, you might have seen in the paper, that the last 12 feet of it will have to tilt up uh, in order for the uh, airplane to get into gates, uh, around air, airport gates around the world. Really incredible uh, engineering feat. And then this is just a little note to talk about uh, all this investment in 777X, knowing and, 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 and the other investments we've made and how they're spurring other growth. You can see a Future Sound Business Journal article here that's saying that um, it's actually getting pretty hard to find space up on Team Field as suppliers start to locate uh, around uh, the Boeing facility up there um, to, uh, to be near the 777X. And then I don't know how many people know what Publicola is, but those of you that are political uh, junkies in the room, 
you probably would never think that Boeing would be quoting a public article uh, in public, but this public article just a few weeks ago talked about how Boeing and Amazon have accounted for 43% uh, of the local job growth here over the last five or six years. Uh, really, uh, you know, sort of a, uh, an opportunity to put on how important it is to set the right policy and then, you know, sort of let the market go and, and, and good things happen. So, a little bit about the market then. So, first and foremost, you should know uh, that over the, that Boeing every year puts out what we call current market outlook. It's a 20-year look at the uh, commercial, commercial aviation market. Uh, the one we just put out in June uh, predicts that the world will need 38,000 new commercial airplanes with a market value of 5.6 trillion dollars. Uh, really unbelievable uh, numbers. There, uh, it's kind of hard to see, but you'll see that they're broken out here sort of by, you know, this is single aisle, so think 737, lots of units. Uh, there's a lot fewer units in these wide uh, body airplanes, but of course they're worth a lot more in the marketplace, and so your, your value starts to almost equalize if you have the wide body uh, to the narrow body. What, um, oh, and then, and then just a note, because I think sometimes people think it's mostly about economic growth. It is largely about economic growth, but uh, with the new fuel efficiency uh, of the airplanes and things, you can see the replacement is actually a large portion uh, of the demand as well. But when you see demand numbers like that, no surprise to know that there are a lot of folks trying to get into the market. So um, Russia is developing its own airplane. Brazil is thinking about developing its own airplane. Japan has developed its own airplane. Canada has developed its own airplane. It's trying to sell that airplane, uh, which is not going so great for it right now, but it is, uh, by most accounts, a pretty good airplane. And of course, China uh, is developing its own airplane. You know, we like to complain uh, about the uh, illegal subsidies Airbus has received over the years in launch aid and other things. And of course, uh, that's because their subsidies are illegal in market distorting. Uh, but you, you should know that Airbus has subsidized, you know, three or four or five uh, airplane models over the course of its existence. Uh, China has subsidized its single model to a greater degree than all of the Airbus models uh, put together over the course of the life uh, of, of Airbus as a company. So it's, uh, they are a very real threat. This is a picture taken in October of the rollout of their new airplane. Uh, this airplane is not yet flying. They've got to go through a whole lot of um, um, you know, approvals and certifications and that kind of thing. But this will be a competitor to the 737 and the A320. Uh, there will be, you know, in 20 years time, more than two commercial airplane manufacturers uh, in the world. And I will tell you that both Boeing and Airbus know that right now. The competition uh, is stronger than anything we've ever seen. Uh, it is not only on capability, uh, which we have traditionally won on, but it is also on price. Uh, now, you know, we have always been able to get a premium for our uh, products in the marketplace. We still demand a premium for our, our products in the marketplace. But when you have uh, an existing uh, competitor who is already subsidized to a, a great degree, who happens to be a very good company and building very good airplanes, by the way, and then you add in a new uh, competitor who is subsidized to an even greater degree only for the first model uh, as the other customer, uh, you need to get really competitive really fast. And so you uh, have seen us talk uh, in recent years about the need for uh, getting more competitive from a cost basis, continuing to keep our competitive edge. You know, anybody here who's in the tech industry, right, or anybody here who has an iPhone knows uh, that the way you do this is you continue to be more innovative than anybody else, but you also find a way to continue to drive uh, price to the consumer and price to your customer down. We are in the exact same uh, position as everybody else is in. Our cycles happen to be a little bit longer, but it's the exact uh, same market pressure. So, you know, you will see us continue to find ways to be as efficient as we possibly can while protecting things like research and development spend and all uh, the other things that go into making not only a great uh, company, uh, but a great community for all of us to live in. Having said that, you know, last year commercial airplanes revenue was $60 billion. This year uh, it will be higher. Uh, as we continue to go up in rate, and we will continue to see, uh, assuming there are no exogenous shocks, you know, good growth over at least the short term here uh, for commercial airplanes, while we have an eye on um, our competition and finding ways to, you know, do what every uh, good business needs to do and get enough of a margin to fund your future growth and your future research. Uh, there is really no place we'd rather be doing it than right here uh, in the state of Washington, and we will be doing it here for a long, long time. If you are interested in uh, joining, we have a newsletter. We've got a new Boeing in Washington website, boeing.com slash Washington, that talks all about 
uh, what we're doing here in the community. Leave your card with Rich or me. We'd both be happy to uh, put you on the list or certainly visit the website. Um, and we'd be happy to have you join the conversation. I know I was only supposed to speak 20 minutes. I probably went a little long, so I don't know how much time Betty we have for questions, but I'd be happy to answer. <laughs> oh, great, they don't want So anyway, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. It, it would seem to me that the, uh, the strengthening dollar would be a, 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 put you at a competitive disadvantage. How big a deal is that? You're beginning their dollar. Um, so, you know, most commercial uh, aerospace transactions are conducted in dollars. Um, so Airbus sells airplanes in dollars, we sell our airplanes in dollars. Uh, one thing that they uh, do that we don't do is they do buy a lot in, you know, in other denominations. And of course, we continue to be largely, uh, our spend continues to be largely dollars. We are like any manufacturer that exports around the country, a strong, a strong dollar is something we have to, uh, we have to worry about. Uh, and of course it does. Uh, mean there is additional uh, competitive pressure. Uh, and then it does mean probably uh, that um, margins for our competition grow uh, as they take in dollars and spend out in other currencies. Uh, we, you know, that, that, we don't have that luxury to the same degree uh, that they do. Um, so yeah, I mean, all good companies have plans and, and, and uh, uh, risk mitigation plans in place. But it is a it is a real issue. We're like any manufacturer, absolutely possible. Go ahead. You mentioned um, kind of a technical thing about a wing that's going to be built up there, and it's so long yeah. that it has to be molded to get yeah. the gates. But I wasn't familiar with that. Can you just talk about so, that? So you know, yeah, okay. So hundred. So each wing is one hundred twenty. So you think you're almost you know two 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 thirty five to two forty something all the way. Uh, and um, you know most airport gates are uh, significantly smaller than that. One of the issues that Airbus had when it built the A380 was it was so big that airports had to retrofit in their terminals to, to allow the plane to get in between the jetways, right, at, at various gates. One of our um, early assumptions, knowing that you know a longer wing with, with carbon fiber uh, composites, a long wing gets you fuel efficiency, one of the things was, well, hey, look, we, we know we're going to have a really long wing because it's going to make for better fuel efficiency, but we did not want to get in a position where we had to ask customers to ask airports to change their gate configuration. And so uh, the solution was, I think, 12 feet at each end will tip up, much like, you know, you see uh, airplanes on um, uh, aircraft carriers do. Uh, certainly not to that degree, it's just the last, uh, it's the last 10 or 12 feet or so. But yeah, they will, the, the uh, 777X will land, uh, it'll start taxiing in, and upon taxi, it'll bring its uh, uh, about 10% of its wing up, uh, so it can fit inside gates. Yeah. Thank you. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Please in the back. <clears throat> I read about the uh, Alaska Airlines Boeing port yeah. biofuel kind of test. Where does Boeing see that going? That trend. I mean, you know, talk about the 737 Max and the kind of 13% more efficient. Yeah. Um, I mean, is biofuels the future, or is there another? Yeah, they're a very good question. Sort of biofuels, how does it fit in with Boeing's environmental strategy? So, I um, apologize if I give you a longish answer to this. So, Boeing has um, a four prong environmental strategy. First and foremost, we're uh, improving our operations in, internal to our four walls uh, from, a, from a waste standpoint, an emissions standpoint. Um, one data point for you uh, in the last seven years, our aircraft production has increased 50%. Our carbon emissions have increased in absolute terms, uh, 8%. Not, not per airplane, but in absolute terms, 8%, just from our operations. So first and foremost, be efficient as you can on your on, 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 on operationally. Uh, number two, work with um, uh, regulatory agencies around the world to uh, have more efficient routes of flying. Uh, Alaska has done some great work. If you haven't heard from Alaska on this, I, I highly suggest you have them come in. They've done some great work in understanding uh, how much fuel is burned just coming in for landing and circling and all that kind of stuff. There's so much efficiency to be gained by modernizing air traffic control um, and uh, allowing you know the airline air, airplanes and airlines to do what they could do if, uh, if the air traffic control system could keep up with them. Uh, number three, of course, is more fuel efficient airplanes. Uh, and we're doing all we can. Uh, and and, and um, before I get to number four, which is things like biofuels, let me just say, you know, we have worked with Alaska and other customers, also with Airbus, 
um, to at what we call IATA, which is the International Air Transport Association. It's a European global uh, uh, aviation, aviation body. We have set targets in place for our industry uh, to reduce its carbon emissions. So you know, we're currently about 2% if you consider all the airplanes flying around, we're about 2% of emissions come from uh, commercial air traffic. We have said by 2040, we will be below 2010 levels, I believe, Rich. Uh, as an industry, that will take us from 2% to 1% uh, of emissions as an industry. Uh, I don't think there is another industry in the world that has voluntarily set uh, 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 emissions targets, emissions reduction targets. Uh, on itself, and certainly no one has done it to uh, the degree we have. And then finally, uh, it's aviation biofuels. Aviation biofuels are really tricky uh, because um, there's a high energy density in uh, fuel, and so you've got to be uh, uh, you've got to be able to figure out a way to refine it to the place where it's identical to jet fuel. Uh, and then the other tricky part is uh, if you uh, you must do it in local places around the world because if you only do it in a few places, you actually burn more uh, emissions getting the fuel to where it needs to go than, uh, than you save uh, flying the airplane. So um, the technology is absolutely there. It's a huge portion of um, the future. The real challenge right now is making it economical uh, and finding ways for the technology and the economics to work and be distributed around the world to where the customers are. Um, that it, look, it's going to take us a while to really figure it all out, but um, the, the technology is absolutely there. Uh, what he was referencing, as you probably saw yesterday, uh, a, a release might have been a paper day, uh, that Boeing and the port and Alaska have uh, uh, announced a partnership to see how uh, quickly we can get to 100% biofuel use out of sea tank. Please. A um, couple questions on that. Um, can a plane fly on bio and then go to back to petroleum fuel? So yes. they can. Yes. So aviation um, <coughs> aviation biofuels are different than sort of a lot of what we think of as biodiesel and other things because they're chemically identical to uh, to jet A to jet fuel. So they so the, the goal here is that you can have a drop in fuel and it can mix on the pipeline or you can drop it in and take it out. Yes, that's that. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Um, yeah, with the um, with a five seven out of production, is Boeing looking at a plane between the three seven and the um, and the double aisle planes? Um, yeah, I think our um, head of sales, John Wojcik, was quoting the article um, quoted an article here a couple weeks ago saying yes to that question. Um, looking, you know, looking at is a, an interesting term. I mean, think we're what, look. Is there a market there for that plane? Uh, and if so, what, what's the technology? What would it cost to develop it? How many, how many um, uh, airplanes could you sell over time? Uh, you know, that we're sort of doing all that uh, right now. Uh, so broadly speaking, uh, in the broadest possible definition of yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Sarah. So where are you at with all the, the changes down at the rental facility? Because I have the pleasure of living up above there, and I've seen a lot of changes down there. I just wondered if there's more in store, or pretty much where you're going to um, be at. You know, so I don't know who all has been, I don't know how long people have been around, you know, the rent facility, but if you look at the landing down there, and that used to be all airplane factory, of course, maybe 20 uh, or so years ago. Uh, we had a big push here 10 years ago, Rich, or so. Um, <coughs> where we got rid of a lot of that land, consolidated down into the current uh, factory footprint. Uh, what happened inside the factory, which a lot of people don't know, is a whole lot of offices got put in there, engineering and program leaders and others, and other folks, which Betty knows all too well, of course. Um, and that has uh, continued. We've also managed to find a way to get a third production line out of those two uh, factories. So the MAX is currently uh, headed down that production line. Uh, there is a <coughs> I would say there is more to come as far as capital improvements in Renton. You know, if you live and you can see the uh, facility from uh, your house, you you will probably see a lot less of it than you have in the past because a lot of it's going to be inside the factory. Um, but there, you know, we're on a, on a constant um, uh, march to improve not only the efficiency of that factory but its capacity. I think uh, uh, just as one measure, I think each year in Renton we process somewhere between 175 and 200 permits for different things we have to do. Uh, inside the uh, inside the factory and, and around the facility, so yeah, we work. There's a lot more to come. Uh, maybe not quite so visible, but a lot more to come. Interesting neighbors down there now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's all kinds of stuff. Please. I'd like to compliment the 737 Boeing. 
They did a beautiful job on the painting on, on the outside of the building. It oh, is a joy. I live two miles up the hill. Mm -hmm. yeah. And coming down, it is it's so warming. Not to Good. The Thank you. Life. And the 12 minutes also really good. Yeah, I like that a lot more now than we do at six. But, um, Thank you. Yeah, there was actually a lot of employee involvement in those uh, in the doors, and of course we've had that up in Everett for a long time, uh, and decided I guess about a year or two ago to put it on on uh, in Renton, and it is uh, really cool. Chris, uh, Bill, your presentation focused on uh, direct in-state or total workforce numbers. Yeah. Uh, is there any way that you can capture, I guess, a multiplier effect? Uh, that is the total number of. Uh, indirect or aerospace related jobs that are provided by your suppliers and partners? Yeah, uh, the number is about three and a half. So uh, it's about three and a half to one is our multiplier. So it's about a quarter million total um, uh, jobs uh, dependent on the aerospace industry, either in, in and dependent on the aerospace industry uh, in Washington. Chris. Sure. Uh, the 747 seems to be teetering, you know, is it going to, does it have a future, does it not have a future? Uh, I saw the Virgin Galactic. Sale? Is there, is there a market there, or is that just a speculative one-off kind of thing? Or? Um, the seven four seven is a really great airplane, <laughs> uh, and it's gonna we're gonna make that airplane as long as we can make it. Uh, you know, the passenger market for really large airplanes is not not big, uh, and the seven four seven has felt it, and particularly the three eighty has felt it because it's. Um, even bigger uh, than the 747. But by, by the way, a little bit of trivia: the A380 is twice the size of a 787. You would actually burn less gas filling up two 787s and flying them next to each other than putting everybody on an A380 and flying <laughs> them on an A380, which is hard to believe. Um, the cargo market has been what's kept the 747 going for a long time. Uh, the cargo market is struggling, um, and so you know we are always looking to see how we can keep things going. But we're going to build that airplane as long as we possibly can. It's just great airplane and it's an icon and there's just too much good uh, about that airplane. Looks like we're about done. Okay, hey, thank you very much.